great to be here. Thank you for the invitation and for the ability to see such brilliant uh, sessions. So I am going to talk about, uh, as Alina said, why we're wrong about nearly everything, which is the subject of this book, which we've just released a special Romanian edition with Ipsos in Romania. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So <clears throat> it's... I'm going to start with a question for you, which has got nothing, very little to do with the main subject of the book. Uh, but uh, it kind of illustrates some of the points that we, we make in the book. So, is the Great Wall of China visible from outer space with the naked eye? Let's do this with a show of hands. Good that you're shouting out there. I want lots of shouting out in a minute. Uh, is the Great Wall of China visible from outer space with the naked eye? Let's do it with a show of hands. Who thinks yes? it is visible from outer space. Hands up high, let's see those hands. So that's about a quarter of people. Uh, I'm afraid those quarter are wrong. It isn't visible from outer space, but don't feel bad about doing that. You've actually done much better than we get in public surveys. We're around 50% of the public across lots and lots of different uh, countries believe it is visible from outer space. When you think about it a bit more uh, in depth, it's kind of ridiculous that it would be. It's only nine meters wide at its widest, about the same size as a regular house. Most of it, not this bit, unfortunately, for this picture, is the same color as the surrounding landscape. It's not a very uh, marked feature in the landscape. Um, but why do we do that? Why do we make those sorts of simple errors? For the first reason is it's kind of like fast thinking in the sense of Daniel Kahneman, is you don't give it a lot of thought. It's a trivial question, so you don't think about it very much. But we also, as humans, we mix scales. The Great Wall of China is incredibly big. In fact, it's one of the largest man-made structures on Earth. But it's its length that gives it that property. And that's not a property that makes it visible from outer space. So we mix up scales when we're thinking about things as humans. There's also a bias called illusory truth bias, uh, which means that once you hear something, you're more likely to believe it the second time. So this was actually a wrong answer in the board game Trivial Pursuit for many, many years. It's still in Chinese textbooks. You probably haven't seen it in Chinese textbooks, but you'll have seen it somewhere, and it's just stuck. And then someone's repeated it, and you don't really uh, think about it too much. And that's a very simple effect. It's been proved in lots of experiments, but has very corrosive effects on things like political campaigning, where politicians know that just repeating a lie makes it more likely to be believed. And then the fourth point is something that's probably more important for the, the whole study, which is, in some ways, we want it to be true. It's quite an interesting fact. It's kind of we, more, it's more emotional than it at first seems. It's kind of something that makes us seem great as a species, that we can build something so big that it's visible from outer space. And I'll come back to the emotional bits. Uh, but then there's a fifth point, which is also really important, which is that now I've told the people who put their hands up that it isn't visible from outer space, you believe me, don't you? Do you believe me? Does anyone not believe me? No, you're kind of getting a few nods from people there. So people do change their minds with new information. You've got to bear that in mind, too. Uh, like I say, that's not the focus of the study overall, the studies overall. It's actually a very big study, over 100,000 interviews in over, up to 40 countries. Uh, and it's very, very simple as a concept. We get people to guess the reality for their country and then compare that with the actual reality and look at the gap between the two on everything from immigration rates to vaccine safety, obesity levels, murder rates, happiness, Brexit. There's a lot of misperceptions around Brexit in the UK, which we can come on to. And even sex. Many, many misperceptions about sexual behaviour. Uh, and we're often incredibly wrong, and that's the whole basis of it. And that immediately raises the question of why do we get these simple things so wrong, and then what can we do about it, if anything? Um, and the best way to show these examples is through some experiment, uh, through some questions for you, throwing out some questions for you. And one of the first concepts, I'm only going to go, go through four in this session, there's more in the book. The first concept is emotional enumeracy, is that our view of numbers are actually affected by our emotions uh, in many ways. And the, the, let's take an example just to illustrate that. On immigration, which is one of the classic questions in misperception studies. So what we do, <coughs> we ask people around all these different countries, there's about 30 or 35 in this particular one, how of every 100 people in your country, about how many do you think are immigrants? Um, I'm going to get you to shout out, and there is an incentive for shouting out, which is uh, whoever does it gets the best answer or the most wrong answer, or the loudest answer, or whatever I decide, gets to win a book. Um, we've got five books, I think, Alina, to give away. We've got five books to give away. If that wasn't incentive enough, 
to shout out. I don't know what is. So do shout out. Let's just pick Romania to start with. Two. We've got a two over here. Anyone else? Six, five, ten. We're going up. This is getting... Just ten, one. Who said one? Very good. It's one percent. So one percent Romanian population are immigrants. But... You did much better than the public. These are the average guesses, the mean guesses across the public about the proportion of these different countries that are immigrants, giving these sorts of gaps, massive gaps between perception and reality. These are the average guesses. These are not... Uh, there's people that go much higher than that. So in Romania, uh, the average guess is that 23%, nearly a quarter of the population, are immigrants. So why does that happen? It's a lot to do with vivid anecdotes. Um, uh, we get drawn to vivid stories, we know this, we are storytelling animals, we get drawn to those. And we also have an evolutionary focus on the negative. Uh, we're much more likely to focus on negatives, and I think you had this in previous sessions, that actually it's a feature of our brains, that in cave people days, where uh, negative information was often a threat, so we had to act on it. And if those people who didn't act on that negative information, the threat, were edited out of the gene pool, so they no longer exist. So we are long-term descendants of people who really focus on negative information. And that's been proven in lots and lots of social psychology and psychology experiments. This is one by a great uh, Chicago professor who wired people up to brain scanning machines and showed them different images, ones that are known to be positive and ones that are known to be negative, and measured how their brain reacted, the different places and the different intensities that their brains reacted with. And this being America, the positive images that they showed were things like uh, pizzas. So pizzas were the positive images. It's actually pizzas and Ferraris were the positive images in America that they showed people. They measured, showed those images, measured the reaction in the brain, and then compared that with negative information, uh, negative images. And that was things like dead cats that they showed people, which often gets a little bit of a, oh dear, uh, that's not so great, showing a dead cat. So I just have to be absolutely clear that that cat is not dead, it is just uh, resting. That is not a dead cat. I don't want you to come away from here and just remember me as the dead cat person who goes around showing dead cat pictures, which, which is actually an illustration of the effect that the professor found, which was that people's brains just react differently to negative, uh, negative images like these. You remember them more, they shock you more, etc. So we've got a natural uh, inbuilt bias towards the negative that we need to remember. Um, there's many similar misperceptions uh, in Romania. Uh, I'm going to run through a couple because we, we added these specially to this edition of the book. So I'm going to get you to do some more guessing. You've already won a book, so you can't guess again. Um, uh, we've got uh, one on a percentage age 65 plus by 2050. So we asked people what percentage of the Romanian population is going to be age 65 plus by the year 2050. Anybody want to know, get a guess the reality? 43, 45, 35, 50, 55, 20, 20, there you go, 20 is getting closer, the reality is 28%, 28%, so that is quite a big increase in 65 pluses, that, that is a, a massive increase, I think it's adding about 30% more to the 65 plus population, 30% more to the 65 plus population compared with now, so it's a big change, we have got an aging society, but the average guess is double that, 56%. So people have heard a lot about the aging society that we all face in Western countries to different degrees, and it's really stuck with them, they think we're going to be very old, over half the population are going to be 65 plus, according to the average guesses, so we've got a book back there that we need to remember. Uh, and then percentage unemployed. Anyone know the specific question is percentage who are working age uh, and looking for work and unemployed in Romania? Five, three, three, there you go, straight away, a three over there. Do remember who got that right answer? Three percent. Three percent, very, very good. You're, getting, you're too good at this. You're disproving my whole theory. Uh, <laughs> Luckily, luckily, I've got some average guesses from the country which are not so good. 40% unemployed. And this happens in lots and lots of countries. Lots and lots of countries. And politicians use this sense 
of things going wrong, of things being worse than they are, uh, to stoke up people's anger. So 40%, 4 in 10 is the average guess. Second effect I wanted to cover uh, was uh, not only do we focus on the negative, we also tend to think things are getting worse than they really are. Uh, it's something, it's a social psychology effect called rosy retrospection, which means uh, you look at the past uh, better than you should. And that can be seen in this simple question on murder rates. Um, I'll just show you the average for the whole 30 countries that were asked this. Do you think the murder rate in your country, we asked in each individual country, is higher, lower, or about the same as it was in 2000? Uh, and we asked this question in about 2016. Um, so, less. Less. You've ruined the whole thing by going straight into less. <laughs> less. You're absolutely right. And massively less. Down 20... 9%, 29% drop in murder rates across these 30 countries, which is more or less G20 plus a few uh, other countries. Um, but that's not the perception. Uh, the blue is lower, so only 15% of people across these countries think correctly think that the murder rate is lower. Nearly half, 40 odd percent, uh, think it's higher with the rest saying it's about the same. So we do not have this sense of things improving. We think things are getting worse when they're not. And again, there's a, another great uh, US psychology professor who's tested this in a, in a kind of nicer way with people where he interviewed people before, during, and after their holidays, before they went on vacation. Uh, and what, it, what we saw was the same sort of pattern on average across all different people. So we start before we go on holidays, and I certainly recognize this in myself, from excited anticipation, where when you're just about to go, you're very excited about going. When you get there, you've got the reality of minor niggles. Uh, things don't quite go as planned. It's not as perfect as you had in your mind. And that means you return with a sense of mild disappointment when you get back. And that's, that's not just because you're back and you have to go back to work. It is just that things weren't quite as perfect as you think. But that wasn't the purpose of his experiment. The purpose of the experiment was to continue to interview people over time. Um, and what he found, again, was the same sort of pattern is after that, our memory grows fonder the longer away we get from the holiday. And that's because we literally edit out the bad bits and just remember the good things. So you forget the kids being sick in the car. That's gone from your uh, memory. And you just remember the lovely walks on the beach or the lovely sunsets or uh, lovely events. So we edit out the bad from the past. Again, not a dumb fault of our brain. It's actually good for our psychological health to let go of bad things uh, from the past. But it has a, a, a negative side effect, which is it makes us think the present and the future are worse than they really are, because we forget the bad from the past. We've got a too positive view of the past. And again, politicians use this uh, frequently in their campaigning communications. And as you'd expect in the book, Donald Trump features quite a lot, I think, as Alina said. Um, and he said this about seven or eight times on the campaign trail uh, in 2016. Uh, the murder rate in our country is the highest it's been in 47 years, right? And you won't hear the press saying that. And there was a very good reason you wouldn't hear the press saying that, um, because it's just not true. This is uh, made up as a statistic. There's a little kernel of truth that its uh, murder rate in the US had a little uptick, a big uptick uh, year on year uh, in cities in America, but the actual level of murder was still about half the level as 40 years ago. So uh, made up, twisted statistics, play, preying on this sense that things are getting worse in order to achieve his own aims, um, which is a real threat. The third effect I wanted to talk about uh, is that our misperceptions are not just random or set for uh, all humans in the same sort of way, in the sense that everyone thinks the past is worse than it is, uh, or everyone focuses on negative. There are Some of our misperceptions are directionally motivated, as the social psychologists call it, which is, a, is the cluster of effects thing, uh, around things like confirmation bias, where you look for things that confirm your already held views, and you try to dismiss things that uh, contradict those views. That's called directionally motivated reasoning overall, uh, that kind of cluster of disconfirmation effects and disconfirmation effects. And you can see that uh, very clearly in one example uh, from the US, again. Uh, we asked people across lots of different countries, do you think more people are killed by guns, knives, or other violence? Uh, so those three options, yes, yeah, shout out, let's go. Guns. 
uh, guns and others with a couple of knives thrown in. That doesn't sound very good for a conference setting, but uh, uh, a few more guns than anything else. It, it is, in fact, guns. Uh, an incredible level of death by guns in America. Um, this is interpersonal violence, not suicide, things like that. This is uh, uh, interpersonal violence, and it's 68% of all violent deaths in America are caused by firearms. Second only to Mexico, uh, where 76 of all uh, percent of all violent deaths are caused by firearms. Uh, and the average guess in America, the correct average guess in America, was uh, 59%. So 59% of people said firearms. But that wasn't the real pattern. The real pattern in, in the American data is this, where it goes from about 8 in 10 Democrats thinking it's guns all the way down to 27% of strong Republicans thinking it's guns. So this is the same reality, same social reality, seen entirely differently depending on your political views in this case. Uh, I don't have time to go through all the... Uh, misperceptions we have around Brexit in Britain, but there are very, very many, unfortunately. Many lies are believed in Brexit, depending on uh, your starting point. But this is a very strong effect among, among humans, one of the strongest, that we hold on to our already held worldview and try to dismiss other things. Very powerful. And it combines with this uh, fourth and final effect I wanted to raise, which is we think what we see is all there is. Uh, again, another social psychology effect where we think uh, our views, our friends' views, our group's views are more uh, correct or more representative than they really are. But one of the key messages from the book and from this type of session is we're not as normal as we think. Bear in mind you're not as normal as you think you are. A really key thing to keep in mind. And that, that's illustrated by this uh, uh, one example from Facebook use. Uh, so we ask people across, again, 30-odd countries, out of every 100 people aged 13 and over in your country, about how many do you think have a Facebook account? Uh, and I'm not going to ask about Romania or any other countries because you've been too accurate so far in this. So I'm going to ask about India. Uh, you need to know Facebook penetration in India. Oh, I can't hear. Louder. 70? 10? 38. You really don't know, do you? You're just random numbers. <laughs> These are just random numbers you're throwing at me. <laughs> Which is so it's actually 18%. Did you say that? You said 20. Okay, you get a book. Uh, uh, 18%. 18% uh, is the average guess. Uh, sorry, is the reality. But the average guesses are extraordinary in India. You shouldn't feel bad about not knowing because the guess in India is 64% that all Indians have, 64% of all Indians have access to Facebook. And this is where it's important to highlight a methodological feature of this study that seems like a drawback, but is actually really helpful. All of these surveys are done online in the countries. So all of our respondents are, uh, have internet access themselves. So this is online Indians we're asking this question of. They have online access, they have internet access, they are much more likely to have Facebook themselves. Their friends and uh, family much more likely to have Facebook access themselves. And they make the wrong leap from that to think the whole of India is like them. So this is, this is a very, very clear example of filter bubbling uh, and being wrong about the norm based on your own experience. And it creates these massive misperceptions. And these misperceptions are important. This is a powerful growing middle class in, America, uh, in India that uh, doesn't know that internet access is so rare and Facebook's access is so rare in India. I have the, completely the wrong perception of that. Um, just to wrap up, a, a few more hopeful points on this. Our perceptions are not a new crisis. Uh, we did some work looking back as far as we could at the data on misperceptions. It does feel like we're living in a particularly uh, fevered age on this. A lot of talk about post-truth, fake news, alternative facts in, in this case. But actually, misperceptions were just as bad in 1940s America, when we've got surveys from that kind of period, all the way through. We're not getting much worse at this. But I have to say that it does feel like it's a bit more threatened now, where we are starting to see many more separate realities because our information environment has changed uh, so much. We can filter and tailor our world much more. And there's some great examples of this from the more academic work 
uh, with a very academic title, Network Graph of Moral Contagion Shaded by Political Ideology, which basically shows, this is Twitter-based data, and it shows how tweets that are about contentious subjects like gun control or abortion travel between the blue, Democrat, and red, uh, Republican, uh, different communities online. And you can see there's ab almost no interaction between blue shaded tweets, ones that are more uh, Republican focus, uh, Democrat focus, and red shady tweets, ones that are more Democrat focused. So these are two entirely separate communities talking to each other with very little making it between uh, the two, which is uh, a worry when you see how important these all we see is, uh, is all there is effects are for us. So to wrap up, how to be more right, um, I think from all of, this, all of the different studies, all of the different effects, there's only uh, five or six things that we need to bear in mind, I think. We can have a more reality-based view of the world, both as uh, citizens, consumers, and leaders of businesses, and it's only four or five uh, key things. First of all, we have to th remember that things are literally better than we think uh, to start with, and that's because of how our brains work. Things are literally better than you think, and you've got to keep reminding yourself of that. Um, related to that, most things are getting better, not worse. We have this tendency to think that things are getting worse, but actually most things, not everything, is, is getting better. And starting from that point, is really important. And it's really important in political circles just as much as in business circles, in the sense of that sense that everything is getting worse is the perfect conditions for people to come in and say, it's not working, the system is broken, we need to rip everything up and start again. And that's where it gets dangerous, where you lose progress. Uh, so most things are getting better, not worse. Bear that in mind. Main point, in many ways, is you're not as normal as you think. You are quite unusual, same for me. We are not as normal as we think, and our own identity affects our views of reality. This is uh, about our identity. It leaks into so much about how we think about different aspects of uh, uh, our world and the actions that we take. Our own identity affects our views of reality, and we can't help that. That is something you have to work really hard at. And that's the final point. We have to work extra hard these days at bursting our bubble. The, the online environment has changed our information that we get. Our filtering and tailoring that we can do is uh, m uh, massively increased, so we have to work extra hard at it. Not only online, though, but from a research and insight point of view, from a consultancy point of view, uh, we have to do that more as well. And that's why this, the growth in ethnography, the growth in observation, the growth in immersion work, and the real impact that they've had on business decisions, that is no accident that that has come through in recent time. That focus on bursting your own bubble, seeing things as they really are, being aware of your biases is the key to that kind of drive. But if there's only one thing that I can leave you with from the whole presentation, you can only remember one single point, it's that the cat is alive and well. Thank you very much. I think all of us have at least one example in mind where a negative emotional um, information has been exploited. But do you have any example about how a brand, so I'm talking about the brand world, where something positive and uh, true mm. has been exploited and has generated a lot of attention and results in the past, I don't know, 10 years? Thank you. Well, that's a great, great question. And uh, I like the way that what you said was positive and true, because it's that authenticity that's really important in this, is actually being connected to a reality and also being positive. So the one that's it's kind of close to private sector brands, but the one that I talk about in the book and has impressed me most is a campaign that uh, was run in uh, Britain called This Girl Can, which you may have seen because it won lots of international awards. And it was called, it was about female participation in sport and physical activity generally. And it was really smart uh, because it was positive. This Girl Can um, was the, the overarching brand. And what it did that was really smart was it showed 
positive realities, but not in an airbrushed way that a lot of sporting activity can be, that you have to aspire to this amazing athletic ability, that you're not allowed to sweat when you are doing exercise, all of those types of things that kind of turned that on its head and showed the reality of activity for women in all its levels, from just getting off the sofa to do, doing a bit of walking all the way up to taking it, taking it much further. And it had incredible effect in the sense of uh, it, it, we measured the participation rates in uh, sport and physical activity among women throughout this period. We, run a separate, we had run a separate study on this, and it had a major impact. It was, had a, it, it was related in a major way to increased uh, participation. And I think the features of it were, uh, mainly, it was smart, it was, quite, it was simple, had all of those types of positive, um, uh, usual communications uh, aspects to it, but it was that sense of not airbrushing. It was a sense of surprise, I suppose, where uh, the world that is usually portrayed for physical activity is so inauthentic to people and so unachievable for people, actually changing that sense of gap between you're supposed to be up here, you're way down here, you may as well give up, to making, bringing it much closer to people, making, making that gap seem much more attainable for people. So I think that there's definitely features within that uh, multi-award winning campaign that you can transfer to many aspects of private sector marketing and brand. So the, the main thing that I try to do in the book that if, it, if there was any sort of small contribution to understanding this is to say that uh, our misperceptions are an interaction between how our brains work and what we're told. So there's a how we think effect, which is how the brain functions, um, all the social psychology. And then there's also the environment, the information environment, what actually comes towards us. And there's loads and loads of great books and study on social psychology, behavioral economics. And there's loads and loads of great studies on post-truth and uh, uh, the information environment, how tech and uh, social communications are misleading us. The reality is much scarier in some ways, because it's a system. This is a systemic issue, where one feeds off the other and reinforces that, and it goes round and round. The, the system is like that because how, of how our brains work. Uh, the system changes in response to uh, how we react to it, and then it reinforces how we think. So this goes round and round and round. And that's why um, things like, uh, how we get information on the internet, the filtering and tailoring that we do on the internet, reinforced by unseen algorithms, is built into the system in the sense of uh, the more time you spend on the platform, the more money the platforms get. Uh, so they show you things you already agree with. And it goes round and round and round. So that sounds quite depressing. But actually, knowing that means that you know more about where to inter interact, where to try to change things, where to intervene uh, with bits. And there are some things that you can do. I think, to be honest, the, the responses of uh, training people better in how to understand uh, how they're thinking are probably going to be the most effective. We've come a long way in the kind of academic research and understanding how those things interact. We're starting to get it into business and uh, into government even more now, getting it into schools, getting it into people much earlier about how to do your own kind of critical thinking will be the best way to uh, change that over time. We can't legislate for this. We can't regulate it away. We need to help ourselves. Thank you. Quite a journey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bobby. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Oh. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, I saw in your presentation the year 2050. So are you positive about the... Um, Robots, for example, the artificial intelligence, how, how they will influence our future? Um, I, in my new job at King's College London, robotics and AI are two of our biggest uh, focuses um, uh, in terms of how it's going to affect society, not in terms of developing the tech um, so much. And I think it is uh, massive and scary. <laughs> um, I think it's bigger than we think right now. Um, if you think of 
uh, some of our professors who, who look at this say we're in this transition period where we just don't know what the effects are going to be. We had a kind of similar transition window for the Industrial Revolution where there was this shaky period, 20-year period, where it was making this transition from one type of economy to another type of economy. And there was lots of uh, wrong turns along that way. And I think we're, we think we're on the cusp of another type of transition like that. We're going to have 10, 20 years, and then it's going to look entirely different by the, that time. Um, whether that looks positive or negative for people, because it can, it's got positives and negatives. And some of the work that we've done gets criticised both from people who think we're too utopian about the future and people who think we're too dystopian about the future. So I think we're kind of in the middle on this. There's going to be good bits and bad bits of this, but it's a much, much bigger risk than I think we're even recognising right now. And, and how it all plays out will, is almost impossible to predict, but there are things we can probably put in place to help people. This is not... The reactions to this, the responses to this, are not about retraining your truck, 45-year-old truck driver uh, because autonomous vehicles are going to come. You're going to have to have much, much, much more deep uh, changes in society and welfare systems and everything else in order to cope with the type of change that we're going to see. Don't forget your books, whoever won.